Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by MetLife. At MetLife, we believe in the value of advice, and that's why we're determined to support advisors with a life insurance experience that is sustainable, efficient, and unique. So, when the unexpected happens, we're there to provide care, compassion, support, and expertise for advisors and their clients when they need it most. MetLife, life inspired by you. Hello and welcome to this series on the new normal, the new risk environment for income protection as we settle into the changes brought about by Individual Disability Income Insurance or IDII for short. I'm your host Fraser Jack and in these episodes we get expert opinions from our superstar panel. We have Kathy KS, Risk Insurance Specialist from Brisbane, Uh, Influential Financial Advisor John Kasher from Melbourne. Uh, Serena West joins us uh, as a risk insurance specialist from Perth. And Dr. Jeffrey Scott from Sydney, head of advice strategy at MetLife. Jeff always has something interesting to add to the conversation. This is a five-part series and we are kicking it off with this, the first episode looking back at exactly how we got to this point in the first place. In the next episode, we will discuss the new mindset advisors should adopt to move forward. Uh, In episode three, we get technical and nerd out about how to make income protection profitable. In episode four, we discuss the human side of the changes and we round it out in the last episode discussing the future opportunities and threats. Let's dive into the first episode now, looking back at how we got to this point. To get us started off, let's kick off with Jeff Scott. Jeff, how did we get here? Thank you, Fraser. How we got here was that ASIC Report 413 asked advisors and also the insurance companies to get a balance between both product and pricing so that clients actually have appropriate protection for the long term. Giving a client a fully featured product was never the expectation. Giving them a gold what they call a gold-plated product was never the intention. It was providing appropriate cover to the appropriate people at the appropriate time. So if something unforeseen happens, that they're going to have the right cover, right money, right time. Yeah, this is a really interesting. This is an interesting um, part that you bring into this. That it was the gold, the gold uh, bar. You know, the best product, the most amazing product was never the intention. That's that seems a little bit counterintuitive for a lot of advisors, don't you think? Sort of, Serena, what do you think? Um, it's always been we've always tried to find the very best thing for clients. Yeah, we typically have, and I think that's in part based on wanting to make sure that we don't let anyone down at claim time. So. You know, we we need to make sure that in the event that they they need the policy, that there's no one else kind of saying, "Wow, you could have got this or this or this." So, and and over time, the products have has obviously got so many features that there's been a lot of complexity. Yeah, John, what do you think? Yeah, it, it's very interesting that that's uh, what's being said because probably similar to Serena, it's um, you know when we're advising the client, we're taking the position that we want to have a, a solution that's got the highest chance or highest probability of them actually claiming on the policy. And so when we've got a a suite of policies that have been obviously designed for many many times, um, you know we're really looking to those and the technology around it. The the industry has kind of adapted to trying to actually make it easier for advisors to identify which policies are better than one another. So it's very interesting that and and you know I'd love to hear from Jeff. Obviously, you know a bit about also how we got here because my understanding is obviously policies weren't as good as they were. Two years ago, um, they got better and better and better and better. And um, you know, is the is the industry also to blame for that um, as well too? So you know, my expectation as an advisor and probably from a client is going to try and find the best solution that's got the highest probability of claiming. John, uh, John, I agree with your philosophy on this, but I think if we go back to first principles, products need to meet a customer need, and the two basic customer needs are either eliminating debt or potential debt 
or creating an income stream for the client. And what insurance is inherently there to do is to put a client back in to the same financial position they were immediately prior to when that claimable event occurred. So if we look at it from that perspective, the policies that we have now, again, the Institute of Actuaries did a study on this, and the policies that we have now that came out on the 1st of October 2021 are still the best income protection policies in the world. Even after them being stripped back or they don't have as many benefits and features now as they did on the 30th of September uh, 2021, there's still a very, very good policies. And so we come back to those first principles of what is, what's an income protection there, income protection policy there to do? It's there to replace lost income and protect the client's biggest asset, their ability to generate income. So we go back to that, Does the do our current income protection policies, whether they're by MetLife or any other company in the marketplace, do they still meet that primary need? And what I'm looking at so far is the answer is yes. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, and Kathy, what are your thoughts on, on on how things happened in the past? Look, I think there's a lot of products that, as Jeff said, you know, the clients had took up products that if they went on claim, it was going to put them in a better position than being at work. And ultimately, that's how we've ended up in the position that all of these products have had to be reassessed and re-put to market because their aim was never to make it uh, monetarily better for you to stay on claim. Um, does that mean that advisors are really having to re-look at what they are insuring their clients for and how they're insuring their clients? Yes, but a combination of industry and advisors have meant that we've ended up in this position. Serena, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was more reflecting in what Cathy was commenting about with some of the older style policies and, you know, I, I still have some clients on the books who have lifetime benefits and some of these policies, you know, they, they've been around a really long time and potentially when they were built and when the wording was all created, um, our current reality wasn't considered, um, you know, it was such a long way in, in advance and the way PDSs are written now, they're, they're so much more specific. The, the difficulty of when you do have a lifetime benefit is, of course, it is lifetime. The funny thing when you're managing a client on claim on lifetime benefit, because I have a couple, is some of the companies don't actually even have access to the original documents because it's been so many iterations a long time. Um, but the pricing attached to these, and, and circling back to Jeff's point, the, the client is receiving income far different to what their actual reality was at the time of claim. And, and that, of course, has triggered what's going on. So I, I can see why the changes are needed to be made. Yeah, the uh, the changes came through. Um, let's say, uh, you know, there was a, the, the, I call it the pendulum, you know, like they went one way, too far, too long. Uh, and then, of course, these big sweeping changes came through like a pendulum and, and went, you know, possibly too far. Who knows? We're all, uh, we're all trying to work out where that line in the sand is, I guess. Uh, Jeff, tell us about the cycles um, because I mean this is this is something that's not uh, you know changes in this uh, changes in income protection changes um, change is something that's you know happened a long time. We've had cycles. We've always had cycles uh, in this type of um, insurance. Tell us about the cycles. Yeah, um, I've been in Australia now for almost thirty years, and I started off as a actuarial trainee. And what's happened is that people have said it's different this time with income protection. Well, actually it isn't. So we've seen these same cycles and they go about every seven to 10 years. What ends up happening is that either one insurance company or a bunch of insurance companies are um, trying to gain market share. So they either relax the underwriting standards or they reduce premium. Then average claims experience comes along and they go, whoops, we're starting to lose money. And when the money's, when they start to lose money, they say, we have to tighten the underwriting and or increase premiums. And then as they start to make profit again by going through that process, they say, oh, well, let's make more generous benefits or let's decrease pricing. And then they complete that entire cycle. And it takes, again, somewhere between seven to 10 years to go through the cycle. 
but this isn't the first time we've seen a situation where the industry has been losing money in the income protection industry. And what they then do is that we'll start to see this happen again. So again, we've seen premiums go up and most people over the past three to five years have seen that occur. We've seen situations where underwriting has been more restrictive. And again, that's happened as well. And then what's happening now is that they've, the, the new policies have been far less generous with the benefits. So, we're starting to see that we're now at the bottom of that loop. Now the question then becomes what happens when the next cycle comes around? So to say that we haven't seen something like this before, I think that's actually erroneous. What we've actually seen is this has occurred. Um, we haven't seen it in the last decade, but again, over the past 30 years, we've seen this happen about three times already. Yeah, I guess I guess the big difference is it was always managed internally though, right? I think the answer is yes. But what APRA's, what APRA's did was that they actually took a look at the industry. And to APRA's credit, they were looking and the industry, they, they went to the industry and they said, the industry has been losing over a billion dollars a year in retail income protection. And APRA, to their credit, went out to each of the life insurance companies in 2019 and said to them, what, do, what are each of you going to do? How are you going to manage this internally? And to their credit, they basically came up with their first set of measures. They consulted with the industry and then came up with their final set of measures in September 2020. And that's what we have now. But in the past, in the past when, when they've managed them internally, there's been a turnaround within a period of time. APRA has been asking this question for a significant period of time. So as a regulator, they had to do the right thing and basically intervene in this situation. Yes, exactly right. And uh, and I, I kind of feel though um, there was a lot of there was a lot of people sort of sitting on their hands in a way. Um, but then nobody really wanted to be the first mover to, to make a big change or a big difference, uh, and that caused a lot of um, angst with regards to to uh, to you know if no one's going to do it, then everybody's got to do it. Um, but as as we moved through that time period, obviously um, cash reserves uh, were a big part of that. You know the the fact that there was a, a, a not a very high return on the money being invested, or you know we had a cash a very low cash environment where it was very difficult for insurance companies to get you know a, a, a solid return on their um, on their cash reserves. So it was assumed that it was all claims uh, was the problem was why companies were losing you know billions of dollars a year. Was it all claims, or was it something to do with cash reserves? The the Institute of Actuaries in their report on individual disability income insurance actually stated that one of the things that across the industry that some one of the assumptions that were made was the investment return on the premiums coming in. The exact words that were used by the Institute of Actuaries that said reducing interest rates have also added to upward pressure on claims costs. And they said the 10-year government bond rate yields have fallen from 5.1% in 20 in July 2010 to 0.9% in June 2020. And consequently, insurers have needed to increase premium rates in the order of 20% to maintain profits. So this is directly from the Institute of Actuaries, um, their Disability Insurance Task Force um, report. So they basically stated that, yes, claims were an issue, but also investment returns were also an issue. In other words, to the, over that 10-year period, the, the difference in returns were um, were over four percent, and so if you're getting four percent less each and every year over that period of time, then when it comes to the profitability of a product, that's going to have an impact. Yeah, John, what do you think? So is that why we also see, like, have seen the level premiums uh, increase as well too? Is this why we're seeing this because of those numbers around the premiums obviously being the premiums not being enough? Let's be honest. Well, I'm not sure about the premiums. It's, it's more about the cash reserves, isn't it? Well, leads on to that, doesn't it? The assumption with level premiums is that, in, in, is that you make your return in those first few years in the hope that you've gained enough, you've gained enough premium or gained enough um, return on that investment in those first few years with a higher premium that you've actually got, you built up a reserve for future years. But that's also based on the fact that you're going to be um, getting a particular return on that reserve. And if the return does not meet what that increased risk is, then the premiums that you have, those level premiums, won't be sufficient. 
So we're in that dilemma is that if you don't get the appropriate return up front and also don't and don't get the appropriate return going forward when the risk begins to increase significantly, then you're not going then you're going to be underfunded when it comes to paying claims. Yeah, now just I wanted to dig into something else you said then, Jeff, when it comes to the you know the difference of nearly four point nine percent or whatever. Well, you know, let's say around five percent difference in returns of what was expected returns um, versus what did was re- returns when it comes to the um, when it comes to the you know the the cash reserves in two thousand and ten. Does that mean that projecting forward the assumption was going to be then that cash would always get five percent return on investment? Uh, from from what I've read from the Actuaries Institute, the answer is yes. Um, and when, again, when you look at old returns on, if you have old whole of life policies, um, normally what they what they assume is that the crediting rate is normally going to be in that in that vicinity. And so, right now, we're at all time lows in relation to interest rates. And people who are and people who have a mortgage right now have been benefiting from it because they can borrow at ridiculously low rates. But we're at all-time low interest rates in Australia, so seeing interest rates that are below one percent is basically unprecedented. Yeah, but uh, but I mean we've been in this environment for a while, and we'll, we'll probably be a bit of you know the assumption is it's going to take some time to move out of that environment. You can't just uh, whack interest rates up, you know, five percent over uh, over a short period of time without causing some damage. Um, so what does that mean for reserves for insurance companies, you know, for, for sort of in the short term and, and medium term? I, I think what it means is that APRA in cooperation with the various insurance companies have said, okay, let's look at all the various levers to make sure this particular product becomes profitable. So the one is product terms and conditions. The other one that APRA addressed in their measures is pricing. So when you're doing the premium pricing, how are you basing your assumptions? And one of the measures that Apple stated is that the assumptions that you that you have with regards to your premium pricing cannot be anything more than eighteen months old, with regards to industry data, and twelve months old with regards to your own data within your organization. So what Apple has basically stated is, okay, let's look at the product terms and conditions. Let's also look at how you price your product based on industry experience and various other factors such as interest rates, and then also going back to the insurance company saying, how are you going to manage claims? So what they asked was for long-term claims, how do you manage that risk? And so to APRA's credit, what they effectively stated was there isn't one silver bullet. It's a combined situation. So one, get your interest rates and your investment assumptions correct insurance companies. Two, get the appropriate product. Three, get the appropriate pricing based on industry claims experience industry interest rates, and also your own individual stuff within your organization. If you only look at one aspect, then you pull one lever, but then you push the other ones in different directions. And to APRA's credit, what they said to the insurance companies is, let's look at everything as a holistic situation so we can actually have a product that lasts not just for 12 months, but lasts all the way through for a client's working life so there's still a product there when they need it. Yep. Now, Jeff, I, I, from, mem- from memory, I remember that, uh, end of last year, that APRA did release some new figures around insurance companies and profitability. Is that was that is that the case? Uh, yeah. So um, the twelve months to September twenty twenty one, so to the thirtieth September twenty twenty one, the the individual disability income insurance stats released by APRA um, said that the retail income protection industry was actually in the black for the first time. Um, to the tune of $124 million. Now, considering that they were in the red to the tune of billions of dollars, this is this is positive. This is positive and hopeful, but I want to see what happens in the next 12 months rolling period. Yeah. Now this is an interesting time frame, right? September 21, that's just prior to any of the changes that's going on. So what uh, APRA is saying in that scenario is there's a it's a profitable industry based on the old products. Or what's happened is that the insurance companies have increased premiums, which you've seen, which most people have seen across the board, and those premium yep. increases have now flown through to the bottom line. So right. again, there's there could be various factors in this. So I want to be so again, it's nice to see we're in the black. I want to find out what the reasons are for that, and, and again, we haven't been able, I haven't found out what those reasons are yet. 
So this is this is very interesting, and obviously for people that are listening, and obviously me here, it's like you know, has anyone run through the companies and the books properly? Um, you know, for me that sounds like a mispricing. If that was in my if that was in my business, obviously I'd be able to probably identify that pretty quickly. But it sounds like if we're talking around those dates, it's just like hmm, increased premiums, same products, no changes to policies. Voila. I think most people's issues when it comes to insurances is, is well, mine anyway, and I, and I know that I'm talking for a lot of uh, other people who I've spoken to, no one likes premium increases. But what we don't like is policy changes and tampering with because personal protection is to create certainty and it's the uncertainty that is driving me and a lot of other people that I've spoken to mad. So very interesting that they've said that and it's just um, – you know, I'd love, Jeff, and I know we've shared a, a yarn on this, but, you know, I'd love for you when you do do the DD on this and get through to the numbers, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is just mispricing from the insurance companies trying to chase the bottom and become the cheapest so that they're on the top of uh, research houses from a premium perspective. I, I think there's, again, as we discussed before, there's probably multiple factors on this. So the question is, is it due to premium increases only? Is it due to increased increased in or improved investment returns, which again, the entire the last year was a bumper year for, for many for many people from an investment perspective, or was this due to reduced claims? There could be any number of factors with this one. And until you actually get under the bonnet and look at it, um, it may be one or all of those factors, or it might be something else that we're not aware of. So again, like I said, it's positive that we're actually seeing it in the black for the first time in, in a number of years. I want to see what the numbers are um, to the end of December 2021 and see if it continues in that trend. And then the next thing I would like to find out is what's the reason for it? Is it just due to investments? Is it just due to claims? Is it just due to premiums or is it a combination of all three? And if it's a combination of all three, then effectively um, what APRA has done is they've done their job properly. Um, they basically said to people, let's look at all the factors and let's try and get this business back in, into one situation. So it, so let's, again, um, I'm hopeful, but I want to see if this is a continued trend. And I also want to find out what the reason, what the, re, what the various reasons are for this improvement. And I think what you're going to find is if it comes back to just premiums and they're overpricing those, there's going to be so many advisors that probably lose their lid because in my instance, that my past two years has literally been dealing with clients who cannot afford the new premiums that are coming out. And for most of my work, that's not a small change and that's not a small piece of work to do. And that is all I am doing um, on a daily basis. So if that's what comes back out, um, I think there's going to be a very big uproar from people who have spent a lot of time um, trying to sort that out for their clients. And, and Kathy, it's it's one of those things. It's you know, has this just been industry over years and years and years and years just trying to chase the bottom? Yeah, this kind of chase the bottom, and then therefore you know setting the expectations where it is. And I think. Jeff hit the nail on the head. There is contributing factors across the board. And, and um, we ultimately, I think everyone's got the same goal here. And this is what it all boils down to. We all need a sustainable, uh, we need a sustainable solution um, that is affordable for Australians to have, a, have also a solution that creates certainty so that when things do go wrong, you know, they're there. And, you know, like you guys, it's, it, it gives, when a family's hurting and you can say to them and say, hey, listen, you've got this. You don't need to worry about, you, you know, don't need to worry about everything else. We've got this. And I had one only late last year where a guy, 32, 33 years of age, had testicular cancer, a couple of young kids, and, you know, just said to the wife, all good, you take care of him and him rest up and we've got this. And I'm sure everyone's got stories. That's our goal, to continue to do that, and, but just have a sustainable solution. So, yeah, let's get this right. And, Kathy, you're spot on. Yeah, I also think that uh, there's probably one thing that could be included in those figures from September 21, which we're not thinking about, and that was just the sheer amount of new policies that were put in place, I think, sort of in the in the second half of this year, or even around when um, – uh, prior to that, around April, when uh, you know the the agreed value was taking place, I think there was probably, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but there was probably a lot of inflows into 
into um, insurance companies that are slightly higher than normal? Uh, I think every, I think the the entire industry in that lead up to the first of April, twenty twenty saw that. But again, I would have thought that would have came through in previous previous um, quarterly results. So this one in particular, um, again, it was it was a well it was welcome news. But I I, I want to again I want to get under the bonnet and find out the, all the rationale as to why. Yep, uh, Serena. There's been obviously if we're looking back at the past, there's been uh, one of the I'd say one of the, the last year 2021 was one of the busiest years for risk specialists. Oh, it it was um, pretty horrifying. I would have to echo Kathy's comments. Seeing clients, particularly if they're in their later 40s, um, where where the premium pricing is, is getting pretty steep anyway, and you're starting to look at is it a diminishing return for these people to even hold the cover, um, to be able to look people you know, straight in the eye and say, yep, you've got another significant increase, uh, that that's not fun. And also then you know, when you're trying to do the work and you're looking under best interest and you've had these changed um, circumstances in terms of what the products actually offer in the in the detail, it makes it really difficult to to genuinely give the client the best outcome because you are looking at what's affordable and and what they have and you know what they have is probably the best one, uh, but but they literally you know are saying to you, gosh, you know this is this has gone up so so much, I can't afford this, so. A huge number of hours is being spent on that. And I think also consumers or clients these days have an expectation that they want you to compare, not fully understanding what a comparison actually means. You know, as much as there is some some similarities to, between insurers, there's differences. And, and then you throw underwriting in. And underwriting is, of course, uh, the key to most things in this um, discussion. So... Clients expect comparisons, and if you don't necessarily want to move people for for a small gain, it becomes really, really difficult and tedious. Yeah, and certainly moving forward, when we when we get into this particular topic, there's going to be a lot of different uh, conversations to still be had with all the existing policyholders uh, around. You know, at what point does does it become the old product become uh, unaffordable, um, and you know is is there, a, you know, at what point does it become okay to start recommending you people switch to a newer product? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, let's let's leave this particular one here. We talked about the, uh, you know, how do we get here, all the things of the past. Um, and in, in the next few episodes, we're really going to start looking forward. And, and uh, in the next episode, we're going to start thinking about uh, the advisor mindset moving forward. So uh, we look forward to catching you all in the next episode. While care has been taken in preparing this material, MetLife Insurance Limited does not warrant or represent that the information, opinions or conclusions contained in this presentation are accurate. The information provided is general information only and is current at the time of production. To the extent permitted by law, MetLife does not accept any responsibility or liability arising from your use of this information. The information about MetLife Life Insurance is general only and does not take into account your personal situation, needs or objectives. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice and should not be relied upon as such. MetLife recommends that you obtain independent and specific advice from appropriate professionals before implementing a financial strategy, including reading any relevant product disclosure statements and terms and conditions. Before deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold any of our products, please read the PDS available at metlife.com.au. And for the class of consumers who the products are likely to be suitable for and any conditions around how the product can be distributed, please read the target market determinations for the products available at metlife.com.au as prepared by MetLife and Equity Trustees Super Annuation Limited. Life insurance products are issued by MetLife Insurance Limited, ABN 75004274882, AFSL 238096, and Equity Trustee Superannuation Limited, ABN 50055641757, AFSL 229757.